Welcome everyone and welcome to a step-by-step -step dry eye workup with Dr. Crystal Breimer. Uh, just as a reminder, you guys have a text box on your GoToWebinar screen where you can enter in questions at any point during this presentation and we'll go ahead and uh, get those read. Our presenter today is the ever-famous Dr. Breimer. Uh, she helped design the Keratograph Crystal Tear Report, has instructed uh, hundreds of doctors in dry eye practices and is one of the foremost experts in the field. So uh, take it away, Dr. Breimer. All right, that was generous. Barbara, thank you. Um, so I, I told him, I said, all right, make sure I'm ready before we start. And then thinking, all right, do I have everything I need? And so my uh, webinar goes to here, we've got Lumify, uh, we've got up neat now to make my eyes white and, and uh, open. And then I have uh, a lot of cores that really at this point aren't even connected to anything because, you know, the mic doesn't work and this doesn't work. And so then they just get piled up. And then last but not least, I have two identical tumblers. Very important, right? Because one is filled with my favorite red wine and the other is filled with water. But you won't know. <laughs> Not that you care, <laughs> but thank you so much for taking time out of your night for yet another webinar. And I know we all kind of have probably hit a wall of getting a little bit fatigued by staring at the computer, um, but I, I hope that tonight will be worth it. I, I definitely want that and, and everything I do, try to make it worthwhile for, for you because I respect your time. So one of my goals tonight is to walk through the actual experience. And I, I recorded this yesterday uh, with my staff, and we'll talk about that in a second. But uh, just wanted you to see what does a what's a screening look like? What's the conversion look like? What does a dry eye eval look like as far as dry eye in the practice and specifically using the keratograph? And then just a really quick summary of if this, then that, what you're looking at, what you could do about it. So that's the plan for tonight. We will be all tucked in and, and done with this within an hour, though. Um, now, I want you to visualize something. So a lot of folks use uh, surveys for their screeners, and I'm proud of them. I'm proud they're using something because when I stand in front of a room and I say, okay, what are you doing as a screener? Um, it, it's a crickets a lot of times. So at least they're doing something. But I want you to put yourself in the patient's shoes for a minute. And they have gotten there. They filled out this survey. Great. They're in the exam room and you're looking at, at their survey, you're looking at them and you're going, oh yeah, we got a problem. We've got a problem here. And what we're gonna need to do is we need some, some lint scrubs, we need some warm compresses. I'm gonna need you to do this procedure. That's about 1500 bucks and I need A, B, C, D, and E. And they're looking at you going, eh, it's not that bad. It, I'm fine, thank you though. Or they say yes and they go home and they start it and they start to feel better and they stop. The problem with either one of these scenarios is they think that what you recommended was based on their symptoms, that it was a subjective correlation. And quite honestly, that is the last thing I want because then they're always going to correlate their success with their symptoms and their need to do something with their symptoms. And so it doesn't really promote good longevity when it comes to compliance with the, the treatment plan. So put yourself in the patient's shoes. This is one way to do it. But imagine this scenario. Your technician does a quick two-minute screening, and that's if you use the NICFA. That's the longest test within the 5M. If you don't have two minutes, do the interferometry instead, and that's what we do most of the time. And it still gives me a snapshot of water, oil, and inflammation by, um, Use my mouse by doing the tear meniscus type, the interferometry or NICFA, and the redness score. Now, um, in doing this, technician takes one minute from the time they put their chin in there to the time they're printing. If you do interferometry, about two minutes if you're doing NICFA, and then you walk into the room and the patient is sitting there with their report in their hand and it talks about okay, you may have symptoms, you may not, there's still a need to take care of this. And on the screen are these three pictures. And now all of a sudden, whatever you see that validates this, whatever recommendations you make, it wasn't based on their symptoms. It was based on objective findings. 
And uh, that's what I want this to be. When I make a recommendation to a patient, I want it to be because of the findings so that it's not correlated with how they feel. And what they do or intend to do is not related to how they feel. So I, I hope I said that in a way that makes sense. But ultimately, think about it. Put your patient in, in, put yourself in your patient's shoes and think about your screening method because screening is a, just a, it's one of the most critical things you're going to do in a dry eye practice. And I've had so many practices say, this is the one thing we started with and what a difference it made. We had so many conversions and, and basically it created accountability within the office of once that patient's screened and, and you've got a big red flag around their name, you've got to do something. Um, and it creates a scenario where the patient's asking you for it. And that's what we really want to do. So I want to show you this video of uh, how it went down in our office yesterday. And I got to say, I, my, my Monica is my right hand person and I value her. I respect her so much and she just makes my life so much easier. But she doesn't love it when I throw things in her lap like, hey, we're going to record this. Go get, <laughs> go get Hannah. Let's do this. So uh, she wouldn't let me watch and I didn't get to watch it until last night. Um, and and I, I talked to her about it later. You'll see some things like she says, unfortunately, a couple times. And I'm like, Monica, you don't really say that. I know you don't. She's like, I know. I heard it. So look at the flow, think about the flow, and then know that there's always little improvements that we can do, and that this is not such a bad idea of actually videotaping it in your own practice. But I want you to think about uh, the time it takes. It took us about, oh, six, seven minutes from the time that she started the screening till I reviewed the screening with her. I asked her to come back for dry eye valve, and then the, the dry eye valve is about, um, about 18 minutes and that was with me doing all the acquisition and the reason I went ahead and did it myself instead of having the, my assistant do it is I wanted to be able to talk to you and walk through all right here's what you focus on don't focus on that focus on this but the whole thing acquisition and explanation was under 20 minutes so take a look at this if you have questions we'll have lots of time or some time for question and answer at the very end um, so just jot them down or put them in that question box on the right side of your screen. What are you here for? Your routine exam, but we're going to do a really quick screening on you. Hold on. I'm going to cut off my camera so you'll have a bigger view. Just a quick test. I'm going to put your chin on the generous forehead all the way forward for me. This next one, I'm going to get it positioned and then I'm going to have you blink twice. And hold open as long as you can. Okay, blink twice. And now hold open as long as you can. You can see her tearing up here, which is just a, a great clue as to what's going on, even though she performs pretty well on the actual Nick button. So don't go by just the numbers. Oh, 
point twice. And now hold open. And I, I love using the Nick bud to talk to the patient about how their dry eye correlates with their vision because a lot of them have to blink to see better. And I can show them, all right, you see how these, these rings are getting distorted. That's the same thing that's happening to your vision when you're looking out. That's why you have to blink to see better. And here you can see you're tearing up again on this left eye. And the last one we're gonna do is just to check your redness. I'm getting focus and I'm gonna have you open your eye real wide for me. If you're wondering, um, I, we did this on staff members because when I make a recording with masks on, it's very hard to hear. So we needed to be able to have, you know, family members. Now we're going to go up here and look at our S. But obviously I need to take care of them better. <laughs> Little low on water in that eye. And a little low in that eye. And definitely based upon your redness, I would say Dr. Farmer is definitely going to want to have you come back for a dry eye evaluation. I know that based upon your symptoms, you've been having a lot of dryness. Mm -hmm. um, that appointment, we have to do it a separate then unfortunately um, it is a very extensive appointment that's going to take quite some time um, it's usually about a two-hour appointment um, and she's going to do a lot of extensive testing for you um, a lot of things that haven't been done previously and that unfortunately does have an out-of-pocket cost that isn't covered by insurance um, which is a 99 dollars fee um, and we collect that right at that, that appointment there um, but i'm going to have her come in and look at you and go over these results with you but let me print this out just for you So I'm gonna stop her there for a second. What I was referring to earlier, that if we had the chance to redo this, I would have we would have fixed. You know, Monica is so good at talking to patients, but she said, unfortunately, twice. Unfortunately, it's a separate visit. Unfortunately, uh, it's this out-of-pocket cost. And I would say, you know, don't do that. Everything that we present to the patient is positive. Uh, so you'll see kind of when I walked in, I, I gave it a different take and that's why. And then this is going to be your result. And I'm going to go grab her. You should be right in, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Anna. Hi. So oh, good. You've got your report. Awesome. Um, let's take a look and see what we've got here. All right, so on the right eye, this is 0.18. I would love it if it started with a three. A little mm -hmm. bit less tear volume, so just the amount of tears you're producing than I would like to see. You did a good job at your endurance um, as far as the tears breaking up quickly, so that's great. That helps being on the computer, but I know that computer's still bugging you from mm -hmm. what I saw. Now, looking here, look at all the redness. There's definitely some inflammation going on, and look at you, you're, you're over tearing here. If we just did three quick little screening tests, and that was enough to kind of push you over. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the other eye. So, yeah, it's still puny here. Um, that's probably a little bit generous, and so maybe a bit, a bit less, a um, little bit less endurance here. Mm -hmm. We started evaporating in about nine seconds, but it's still really good. Um, still some redness, and not quite as much over tearing here. So here's what I think we should do. Um, based on this and based on some of the symptoms you're having, 
I want us to finish our routine exam, get that out of the way, and then bring you back and let's go through some extensive testing so that we can get to the bottom of it. Then we're not just doing trial and error and throwing stuff at your symptoms. We've really got a, an equation to work with where we see here's the problem, here's a solution that's that's targeted for that, and we're going to get the best outcome that way. Sound good? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's finish up next door. Okay. <laughs> All right, you notice here, look at this long list of different uh, choices we have as far as work lists. Now, depending on what I click on, it's gonna dictate what pops up in this right-hand column and thumbnails. The reason that you wanna take the time to do this is because this right here is what empowers your assistant, your technician, because it lets her look at the appointment type and say, oh, this is a Procara, oh, this is a blepharitis follow-up, oh, this is a corneal staining follow-up, and all she does is click on what you've already you know, set up in here, and the work list comes up automatically, and then all she does is follow the directions. And as soon as she clicks a picture, it goes to the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And that way, you walk into the room, and you've got exactly what you want, and she was able to deliver that. So it, it gives her autonomy and, and value, and just she knows that she's a huge contributor to what's going on here. So. It is uh, just well worth it to take the three or four minutes that it actually took to set up every one of these. But to think through what is it that I want acquired in my data acquisition part according to the, the appointment type that, that this patient is coming in for. And of course, if you have multiple doctors, you can set up multiple doctor scenarios. I mean, this is kind of limitless. Same thing if we were doing the treatments. You can set up you know, as many different treatment routines as you would like. All right. Welcome back. Thank you. Okay, yeah. So last time we, we did your routine, we found some things on the screener, and now I told you I wanted to look at it more in depth. So here's what I mean by that. We're going to be looking at is there enough water, enough oil, is there allergy, inflammation, bacteria, lid function, something systemic, something environmental. And we're going to do tests in every category, more than one, and we're going to find whatever's positive and pair it with a treatment that's targeted for that, that I know is going to work for that problem. And as long as we do that, it's very much if this, then that, as long as we do that, we'll get the right outcomes. Get outcomes about 95% of the time. Um, but it might be a little bit of work up front mm -hmm. because it's not just going to be one thing likely. And we've got to treat them all at once so it's not just a band-aid. Now, every time you come back to me, I'm going to be able to show you some of our benchmarks. There's about three or four tests I do every single time. And then we're both going to be able to see the progress. Anything you're, you're winning at, that we're doing well at, we can back off on the treatment. Anything we're not winning at, we go up a level of aggression. And so my goal for today is just to get the data and show it to you. And I just want you to understand it. You don't have to remember a thing. Just understand it so that it makes sense of why I'm recommending something. And then I'm going to go through with you, all right, here's a problem. Here's our good, better, best options. And we'll decide together. Okay. And then everything's going to be written down. You're going to have a ton of resources to go home with so that you can pour through it on your own. Sound good? Yes. All right. So let me get you comfortable because it'll take us about six minutes or six or seven minutes to get through this. So bring your chin right up there for me. And for the most part, you're just going to look straight ahead. Are you comfortable? Yes. Awesome. And look right in the center of the rings and hold real steady. When you hear that little ding, you'll know that I just took a picture and it's a great time to blink. And focus on the tear film there. Oh, we need to click our auto advance. There we go. And now I'm taking it for me. And a good picture of all this stuff floating around your tear film. Blink again. Perfect. Do 
blank, blank. Great. And next, I am looking for some color for me in your tear film. Blank, and that would represent oil getting in there. Blank. Perfect. Just gonna measure the shape of the front. And then we'll get our redness score for today. And now go ahead and look up for me. A little bit of migrating makeup. And I'm focusing right on that lid margin to get all the tiny little details. And a lot of times we'll see makeup moving around. And I also want to get a good look at the base of those lashes. Look down for me. And then I'd like to get a profile look here and see if there's anything to take a picture of. And if not, I'm going to rotate up and really get a good image of these follicles. Change my lighting just a little bit. Perfect. And now look straight again. I'm looking for the rainbow. I got a little color on this side. Blank for me. And blank again. And blank again. Good. Not much, but a little bit. Which eye bothers you more? Usually the right brain's more. Okay. And now look up again. Same thing. Good shot. And look down. Not much on the profile image of the lashes. And now check in a little closer. We see some pouting blades. The reason I said not much on the profile, um, sometimes, especially if someone's young and it's hard to pull their lid up where you can really see this this spot right here where the collarettes would be, you can get just as much information to show them with them looking down and uh, catching the profile image. I, I don't really want to rewind it on you, but let's see. So right here, and it's, it, it didn't stop it at a super clear spot, but if we have the lighting just right and someone has collarettes, you can also show it to them this way. So look and see what's the best way for them to see it. I measure the lashes, and now check in a little closer. We see some pouting blades. Okay, perfect. Uh, next up, I am going to put a little dye in so that I can see how the tears are flowing. I can see if there's any damaged cells on there. And this is orange. It's not going to hurt or anything. And just look up for me. And I'm going to put three drops in total. So one in the left, one in the right, and then a second one in the left. I'm going to do that because a lot of times folks run out before I get to the left eye. We've got to have enough in there. I look straight. And what I want you to do is go ahead and blink a few times. I'm just getting set up, okay? So blink as much as you want, and then I want you to hold it open. All right, so hold it open as long as you can stand it. You can see those tears breaking up, a few little damaged cells on there. And now I'll go ahead and blink. I'm sure it's burning. <laughs> good. And then the other eye. So yeah, we lost some fluid in here. It may still be enough if we turn the light up. But I don't like to do that um, too much. I'd rather keep my light down at the normal level and just put in a little bit extra if needed. I know you drain extra fast. Mm. You look up. One more drop in the left eye. 
And now, I'm going to ready your blank a few times. A few more times. Okay, stay open as long as you can. Now, the reason that I always say, I'm just getting ready, you go ahead and blink a few times. I don't want to, to deliver a, um, you know, an order, a request, okay, blink, because then the patient's thinking about it. I want to try to capture spontaneous blinking so that then I can slow that video down later if I suspect that there's partial blinking and I'm able to show them and I've got four or five blinks on the, on the video. Um, and then usually I'll ask them to blink again at the end. So always do that because with your fluorescein video, you are getting so much information. You're getting information about staining and the pattern of it and what that means. You're getting information about um, it, of course, the stability of the tears and the breakup and the pattern of distribution when they blink. But you're also getting information about corneal integrity, if there's uh, EBMD or some other corneal dystrophy that's epithelial you're getting to show them if the lid margin is lumpy and thick and rolled. You're getting to show them if there's a lot of conjunctival chalasis. So your fluorescein video is one of the most important things that you'll do. We've got a little bit of staining on both corneas. And just watching how stable your tears are, which are not bad. Blink a few times. Okay, stay open. Good. Now, the last thing I'm going to do, Hannah, is I'm going to flip those upper lids so that I can see underneath and image the glands and see what kind of shape they're in. So what I'm going to ask you to do is to look down. And it's not going to hurt, but just uh, don't squeeze on me. Keep looking down. production on that. I got a mass email today that said you can get 200 of them for $96. So, you know, reach out to them if you're interested. I love, especially in COVID times, being able to pull out a brand new stick. It makes it easy to flip the lids. It's got a long handle so you can do it behind the bowl. It'll help your techs be able to be um, more confident and better skilled at this. And then it's got a beautiful, uh, other end of it that allows you to rotate that lower lid so you get really good mybography. Now you saw a second ago I was manipulating the lid because you got to get rid of this glare. Anywhere there's white uh, reflection it's going to end up as a black spot on your image. Okay now go ahead and sit back. Right. There's one quick other little thing I want to do. Bring your chin right up there for me. Now, you notice I slid the, the 5M over, and on the other side was a slit lamp. This is a Pico stand. It's also made by Oculus. Um, it's hooked to the chair, and then my four-opter is on the arm and a lamp as well. So in my setup, I really like it. You can still have the tech uh, do the workup, and then you could have a screening station in any other exam room. So Monica can do the workup, and I can actually see the patient in the other room if that's what I want, but it allows me to have this flexibility to swing back and forth if I want to capture extra 
test or if I want to do something to the patient before I capture the data. And I'm just going to clean this lid margin and I'm going to squeeze and see what's coming out of the glands. They look up for me. Now you're going to notice. I did the entire exam with the Oculus except for two things. I, I'm debriding the lid. Well, make that like we expected and a little more um, film on top of the makeup. Definitely more on the left eye than the right eye. And then look up for me. I'm squeezing on these glands to see what's down in there. Well, that might be tender. Um, not much coming out, and on a couple of them, I'm getting this real thick, semi-solid toothpaste coming out, but not much of anything. And we'll see the right eye look up. A little squirt of toothpaste there, a little bit thinner toothpaste. So I've got more movement on the right eye, but it's still not a liquid. It's very much a semi-solid. So we want that to be olive oil, and it's more like Crisco mm. right now. All right, sit back for me. Let's walk through these findings together. So whole exam at the Oculus, except for debriding the lid and expressing the lid so I could see what's the actual function of these meibomian glands in addition right. to the structure. Now, what I want to do is show you the right eye versus the left eye and compare them. So tear volume, looking okay. It's about where it was last time. Mm -hmm. That's the right eye. I always like to, to measure right about here in the lowest spot that I see and be real careful that I'm getting a true measurement. And you see that one popped up orange mm -hmm. because it was lower. So like I said before, I'd like it to start with a 0.3. Uh, make sure you're drinking lots of water. And if you look here, see this is this is more like makeup, mm -hmm. but when I went along this edge, there was also a bit of a film that was built up there. Um, you can see some of the glands are puckered up like little pimples, see that? Mm -hmm. And look down here in the lashes. You see this? This is bacteria down in here. It doesn't look like mascara or something you did. It looks like something you'd like to get rid of. That's the right eye. The left eye, surprisingly, was a little bit cleaner. We still have these little pouting glands and a little bit of activity at the base mm -hmm. of the lashes. Now, upper lid, same thing. Um, on a good note, I don't have a lot of vascularization along the lid margin. Like, this is actually a good looking gland. See that big pool of oil that, that came out when I pushed? But bacteria here and a lot of glands that aren't moving oil. Other eye, you can definitely see them puckered up here. That one's pure white down in there. You can see kind of how it's blanched out along the lid margin. And we need to get you a good cleanser. Now, right eye. You can tell I'm focused in the right spot because you can see debris moving in the mm -hmm. tear film, but there's no color. This should be color prism, like a rainbow, like when it rains outside on a greasy spot, but I don't have anything. And that's because the oil glands that are along this lid are not pushing oil into the tear film the way they should. Mm -hmm. This is a problem because then if the tears evaporate quickly, you end up burning like you do, and you've got to blink or you've got to blink to see better. Now look at this. You see this little shot of blue down in the bottom? Yeah. That's the left eye, and we're actually getting a little bit of oil in the left eye, which surprises me because in general the left eye looks a little more inflamed, and when I squeezed, it was much thicker here than it was on the right lid. But I didn't squeeze on the, the upper lid to see what was happening there. Now the oil content is going to cause evaporation. So if we watch this, your tears right now are green. And then just within a couple of blinks, look how dark the whole screen gets. Mm -hmm. It's because you're draining that fluid very quickly. Um, your endurance is pretty good, but see the tears are breaking up over here on the edge. And you'll also notice these green spots. These are damaged cells. So we need to improve the integrity of the cornea, make it stronger, make it more defensive. And when you go to this side, you'll notice there's a whole lot more of these damaged cells. And they're very... Um, sectoral, which means they're over here on this one side, and it's the side closest to your nose. Also, when I flipped the lid, there were a lot of bumps under that lid, and so this leads me to believe you've got an allergic issue. Why it's so much stronger on the left side, I don't know, unless there's something you do on that side, like sleeping on your left side or something that's influencing it. So we'll get into that, but you can see the tears breaking up. See all this dark area over here? Yeah. And then within a couple blinks, the whole thing goes pretty dark. I had to put drops in. You know, three drops in that left eye just to get the imaging. 
So we said that the glands along the lid were a little puckered up. They're not letting the oil out. It's making the tears evaporate quicker. But the long-term risk is that we actually lose the glands because this is a one-way street. If the oil can't go out, it can't go back in. If the body doesn't keep creating it, nowhere to put it. It just starts drying them up. Now, luckily, you've got some beautiful glands up top. And down, down on the lower lid, it's not bad. I'm seeing some changes. Do you see these horizontal lines? This is blockage right here. Mm -hmm. You see how we're just losing definition? What happens is they start to get shorter. You can see it right here. There's a clean break right there. Look how short this one is. Yeah. We're losing definition on this inner corner, and that's what always goes first. So if you look at this, here's normal, and you're not too far off on that upper right lid, so I'm proud of that. Um, on the lower right, you know, we're not quite normal, but we're not too bad. So we're, we're maybe between those two. And then on the left eye, a little bit worse. You notice how short these are compared to the right lid. Mm -hmm. And this is the eye where I squeezed and it was very thick what was coming out. Upper lid still looks good. A um, little bit more stagnancy. And you can see through that tiny little remnant there. Mm -hmm. So let's see how this one scores. About the same on the upper lid, but the lower lid, I would equate it to this one. Um, I've got more glands on yours than this one, but these are a little longer than yours. Now, last thing, you see all this debris in the tear film. It's a lot. Uh, some of that's from makeup. Some of it's from that film that was on the lid margin. Some of it might be allergic mucus because of the other signs that I'm seeing. And some of it may just be inflammatory proteins. and basically not having enough fluid in there to dilute it. So we've got a lot of different contributors there. Here's the left eye, just as bad as the right. And that's going to improve as we go on. Now, look at the, the lid from afar. You see there's redness, yes, which is a sign of inflammation. But I'm also looking at the lid margin and how thick or thin it is. You can see it's thinner here, and it starts to thicken up there. But you've still got great shape, a nice plateau. I don't want to see this getting rounded and big and lumpy. So we need to, to make sure that doesn't happen. You can see on this one, it's thicker all the way down. Mm -hmm. um, and the left eye is just a tiny bit more advanced in some areas. So in general, a little bit of inflammation both sides. I want to get rid of this redness. I want to get the glands moving um, in, a, in a more productive way and making cleaner oil that will help your your eyes not burn when you keep them open to the computer, help your vision be more stable. And I want to eliminate whatever allergic um, influence is there. So if we, we kind of sum this up for us, number one issue looks like it's glands. Now, a close number two, because they're always tied together, is inflammation. So really they're tied for first place. Mm -hmm. Inflammation in your body is creating thicker uh, oil. And we need to thin that out by decreasing the inflammation, and we need to keep it moving. And we can do that through, you know, anything from good being diet and supplements to being more aggressive, which you will have to, and at least doing some at-home movements of either an extensive warm compress or the new Liz device that helps a massage and move the, the oil. Good thing about that is it would also take care of the bacteria. Now, the more advanced treatment in office would be doing lipoflow to evacuate those glands or doing IPL to reduce the inflammation and have a secondary effect of thinning out the oil and therefore giving you more movement. So we've got lots of options, and we'll discuss kind of pros and cons. Um, but basically, if we stick to just the kind of homeopathic stuff, I don't think it will be enough for you unless we did an office procedure to go with it. But if we do that, it would likely keep us off of prescriptions and a lot of drugs. Um, and so it, it sounded like that was more of something that, that appealed to you. So I want to lay out a plan for you that, that goes that route, and then we can adjust it um, as we go. Sound good? Sounds perfect. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I stopped the video so many times it made it longer, but um, one thing I didn't do in that, and, and just to kind of explain why, we threw this together, I wanted to have something to show you, but to be clear, um, Monica, that was only the second time she had ever done an acquisition, and so this is not hard, and, and she had visualization up there in the corner of what the image is supposed to look like, and she was going with that to help her get the right image. 
Um, and, and quite honestly, I didn't even train her. I told her how to do it on the phone the week before because Monica is my right hand, but that's not normally her job. Um, long and short, she was brand new at that and still did a fantastic job on the spot, on the fly. And then Hannah, um, she's up front as well. And I had never done a dry eye eval on her. So all of that was very impromptu, very on the spot. It's the first time I'd ever looked at her behind the slit lamp and you got my first impression of what I saw. Um, one thing that I didn't do that I always do with patients and I don't know why I was just worried about time and I had to get out the door, but I usually will explain that collage uh, setup. And that's one of the most valuable things about the 5M. Uh, so when we get to one a little bit later in here, I'm going to walk through how I would explain it as a collage because it really ties the whole story together. And ultimately, why does that matter? It matters because the patient wants to know why. I cannot stress this enough. I preach about it all the time, but um, lately I've been expanding kind of my content, my perspective, and and making it a lot more holistic and, and talking more about lifestyle and how that plays into the patient's outcome. And this is a study that I ran across that just stuck into my mind. Harvard Library, the researcher cuts in line at the Xerox machine. Yes, it was 1978, but I think we could still learn from it. <laughs> and she says, uh, excuse me, but I have five pages. Can I use the Xerox machine? 60% said yes. They're nice people. Version two, excuse me, I have five pages. May I use the Xerox machine because I'm in a rush? Oh yeah, well that's understandable. And 94% said yes. However, version number three, excuse me, I have five pages. May I use the Xerox machine because I have to make copies? That makes no sense whatsoever, but yet 93% said yes. Almost the same that you know had the compassion on her because she was in a rush. Here's my point. Patients want to know why. They need a because. Now, with that kind of same scenario, we have to be careful of what the because, the power of the because. You know, we've got to make sure that it, it really does make sense and that we're not manipulating that in any way or that we're not using it in our own lives to make excuses for things. So long and short, show your patient the why. It really does matter. And they want to know. As long as I take the time to show them what's going on, they will do what I ask them to do. It builds this trust. It makes it where they know that it, I have their best interest at heart, and that's the only thing at the root of what my recommendations are. So spend your time on that, on that collage image, showing them the why. Ultimately, it's complicated. There are a whole lot of things that are contributing to their outcomes. And it's not just the systemic and the ocular disease. It is the lifestyle. It's everything they're exposed to, their stress, their anxiety, their sleep, their nutrition, you know, their environment at work, all this stuff. And so it's overwhelming, but if you can just show them why, they will do what you ask them to do. And that's what makes this device so beautiful and makes it different than a mybiographer or, or some other um, care graph that, that doesn't do all that. So keep that in mind. Uh, real quick, just running through, what's the big picture here? Looking at the face, looking at the lids, walking through your, your slit lamp exam tells you what your diagnosis is. Um, especially when you add to it the data you can get from the 5M. Why are you doing it? Because your patients want to know. You want to run through those categories and be able to tell them, is there enough water, oil, allergy, inflammation, bacteria, lid function, something systemic, something environmental. But if you feel overwhelmed by that, don't worry. Really focus on these two. I hardly ever see a dry eye valve patient that doesn't have an oil and an inflammation problem. Look at the structure, look at the function. That's it, structure, function, and then decide What's my go-to when they have an MGD issue and when they have inflammation? What's my go-to? So have this plan down pat. And then as a secondary, I've got a whole lot of patients with bacteria and lid function problems. So get your plan down pat for that. If this, then that. So that you know, what am I about to ask this patient to do? But the key is, it doesn't matter what you ask them to do if you're not able to communicate it effectively. So this is what creates compliance, that patient education piece and the compliance creates the outcomes. And you've heard me say this a million times because I believe it to my core. The outcomes create the referrals, the growth and the revenue. And it's, it's uh, not really stoppable. Once you work on those outcomes and you're good at it, the rest is gonna come. 
but you've got to have that communication. And for me, this is what it does. This is what does it for me is using the 5M and going through that collage, being able to say, oh, you're low on water. Look at these glands, how they're, they're puckered up like little pimples. That oil is not getting out. It's not getting to the tear film. And I know that because there's no color there. There should be a rainbow in there, like when it rains on a greasy spot. And, and I also know because the tears are evaporating so quickly. And the real danger is that over time, those glands will atrophy and dry up and die. And there's also all this debris in the tear film and it's causing toxicity and redness and inflammation. Look at this lid margin, how thick and rolled it is. And then I can say, all right, our number one issue is oil, inflammation. Our number two issue is whatever it is. Um, and really walk through a plan with them, be able to do it quickly, but more importantly, be able to do it in a way that they understand. And when they understand and you've taken the time to show them, the compliance is there. It also helps build my staff because they know what to do. There's an example of what to do and how to get there. No matter what your motivation, start with the outcomes. And with this, you're able to get the outcomes because you've got the communication. Um, gonna open it up for questions, but the last couple slides I just wanna share. If you, I know you're seeing a ton of dry eye in your practice. There's no way you can't be if you're looking for it. So definitely be looking for it. But if it's a demand in your practice, which it's got to be, um, go deeper. There are so many resources out there. I can speak to the Dry Eye Institute more than any because that's my baby. And I'm just so proud of it and how much we've expanded. It's now a day and a half and we do a, a lot of virtual programs. And we have a lot of different platforms where you can do it. Uh, a recorded session on any day that you want to and walk through it alone. But now we're training entire offices and I'm so excited about that because then it takes the burden off of just your shoulders. So there are so many resources out there. Um, you don't have to do this alone. And that's what's exciting about it is, you know, with ours, we really walk through the billing, the coding, the patient education, the staff training, the everything, the product demos and give you a taste for it. So. I know it looks like we have three minutes left, but maybe we have like five, six minutes left, maybe. Um, so I'm going to kick it back to to Carter and let him see if there's any questions out there that are just burning questions. <laughs> Perfect. We do have uh, a number of questions ready to go. We'll try and keep it fairly short, but just one final reminder for all of you that uh, have attended tonight. One, just thank you so much for being here. And uh, secondly, there is a chat box on your GoToWebinar screen. So if you have any questions that you desperately needed answers, now is your chance. All right. So uh, to get us started, uh, do you have a preferred device that you use for thermal expression in your office treatments? I use LipaFlow. Now remember, I started a while back, so it was before a lot of these others came about, and I don't know. other things have come about, and when I, I look at any purchase, here's my go-to in deciding. Number one, efficacy. If it works, you will pay for it. Quit worrying about how much it costs. Don't bring something into your office that doesn't work because it's gonna ruin your reputation. If you can pay the note on it each month, then you're not just paying the note, and when I say pay it, I mean generate enough revenue to pay it. You're growing your practice. You're growing your reputation by having it there. So I, more than anybody, I imagine, I had so much financial baggage and I just wanted to pay for everything cash and just wait, wait, wait. I was so stupid because I wasted 15 years in that mindset. And when I switched to this other mindset of, daggone, I need to get what I need and get to it. My practice exploded more than it had the 15 years before that. So don't get hung up. Um, now, since then, other things have come out. So one is eff efficacy. Number two, patient experience. So I'm thinking about LipaFlow right now. Efficacy, fantastic. Patient experience, fantastic. It feels like it was worth the value, that it had the value to the price. Number three, the business model. So I want you to think about how many you expect to do over the course of the next three years. How much are the activators gonna be in addition to the price of the device? And then number four, the people behind it but it's gotta be in that order. So here's my point. I already had LipaFlow, it works fantastically, it's a great patient experience, and the business model is pretty wonderful because the activators are so inexpensive. A lot of the newcomers to the market, um, cheaper device costs, but bigger activator costs. So if that's what you need to do, and you're really a primary care office that's not really looking to be a dry eye office, but you want something to offer, then it's okay to go with something like tear care, 
that's going to be a lower um, entrance cost, but be careful because your, your activator costs are higher too. So think about your end goals and don't worry so much about how much does the entrance cost. Uh, think about efficacy, patient experience. Did it seem like it was worth whatever it is you charged them? Business model, what's the differential between your activator cost and what you're charging the patient? Great. Thank you for that uh, in-depth answer. Uh, speaking of efficacy, um, I have a question asking about omega-3s and uh, how the type of omega-3 impacts the patient outcome. I think there's a huge difference between omegas. Um, I carry two in my office. I carry Science-Based Health Hydrolyze, which is an omega-6. It, it has black currant seed oil that you cannot get in a regular diet. Um, and I carry PRN and it's an omega-3. It's a triglyceride form, more than 2,000 milligrams, and it's a three to one ratio of EPA to DHA. And I think there's some magic in that formula. Now, when do I choose which? When a patient comes in and they have got all these systemic ailments and they've got joint pain and lethargy and all this stuff and there's some big question marks in there and they clearly don't have a good diet, I'm going to go omega-3 probably because of just all the research behind it systemically in so many different areas of medicine, like the Arthritis Foundation and, and even omega-3s in general. You're talking about helps with uh, cholesterol and brain activity, dementia, ADHD, asthma, fatty liver, cancer, all these different things. But let's say I've got somebody who seems to have pretty good control of, of life and, and their body. I'm going to go with HydroWise because it works really well and it's something that they can't get in their diet. So I know it's going to benefit everybody no matter what they're eating. But the reality is whatever I start with, when they come in, I'm going to express them every single time. And if it's turbid coming out, semi-solid, whatever they're on, I'm going to add the other one. And they work beautifully together. I'm going to add them at full dose. And then once they come to me, because every time I'm expressing, when they come to me and it's not thick, then I'll back off to half dose of each. And I would much rather do that than put them on doxycycline because it's going to be better for their gut health and they're going to have more positive side effects instead of negative side effects. And That's I'm a great answer. So fast. I guess I could just keep talking normal pace and you could click the end button if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here for everything you have to say. In fact, we have even more questions coming in, so uh, thank you all for being such an engaged audience. It's uh, nice to hear that you've stuck with us all this time. All right, so if you have a patient uh, with rosacea, uh, how do you decide when to treat it versus when to recommend that they see a dermatologist, and do, how do you explain to a patient that they need IPL? You know, I haven't really recommended that they go to a dermatologist, so I guess I just bring them all in. Um, when I first started IPL, I had a very narrow funnel, and the more rosacea, the better, because I thought, oh, it's going to help you. Well, I just didn't know better, and, and my funnel kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger because everybody I did it on, it helped. And so now I do it on people who I don't even see a lot of visible facial rosacea, because it's so powerful at reducing inflammation and stabilizing that patient, I haven't found anyone it doesn't help. Now, I typically will do four sessions about a month apart. You can do it safely at two weeks. I don't like waiting more than five. If somebody's got just leathery, horrific rosacea, I'm probably gonna do five sessions. After those initial sessions, I'm gonna bring them back six months to do another one. As far as how I explain it to them, I say, uh, in my dry eye valve, you take the mask down, it's okay for a second, <laughs> and I get my transilluminator out and I look at their face and I'm looking for vessels, I'm looking for pinks, um, and I'm, I'm looking for other things too that might motivate them to want IPL, and I'll talk about that in a second. But I look at their face and then I go to my oculus and I go through the exam. When I get to the end, and I'm looking at the lid margin with them and I'm being able to show them it's lumpy and thick and raised and rolled and here's all this vascularization, then I bring in the face and whatever their presentation is. And I explain that this is the tree trunk, these are the branches, that this is just an expression of really everything else that's going on in the body. But if we treat the tree trunk, we're gonna get a lot better, quicker outcomes than spinning our wheels treating the branches. Dermatology has been doing IPL for 30 years, and what they found is that patients with dry eyes were reporting improvements. 
So 10 years ago, they created a protocol just for dry eyes. Um, and the, the cool thing is you still get the cosmetic benefit of it. Uh, my buy-in is over the top because I'd say it's about 90%. And I think it's because of these couple of things. They can pay as they go. I don't make them pay up front and uh, the cosmetic benefit of it. And what I do, I do the Perryman protocol where I put the shields in, I do the lower and upper lids, I do the Toyos protocol ear to ear on this MGD settings two times, and then I do cleanup, which is her part, the Perryman protocol, and basically whatever they need. If they're more pink, I'll do the erythema setting and do it everywhere. If they have telangiectasia, I'll do that setting, get rid of the vessels, um, and then you know whatever else that it can do that they have, I try to take care of for them. <laughs> awesome. All right. So next question. Uh, I have a doctor asking uh, why even bother kind of doing the kind of, the, you have them do the dry eye evaluation, like the speed or the ODSI or whatever uh, screening questionnaire you're using. Um, why have them do that, that quick little three test screening um, instead of just bringing them back for a separate dry eye evaluation? Okay. Just based on the symptoms that they're having. I don't do the speed or the OSDI. I don't have that in my office. You can't find it anywhere except on my computer because I don't want them doing that survey as a screener. I don't want anything that I recommend to be based on symptoms. So my only screener is those three tests because I want it to be an objective finding, number one. And number two, I want to walk in the exam room and then be looking at the report and asking me, hey doc, what's this? Why is it all red? as opposed to me pulling something from them. It's a totally different outcome. And you think back to all the optical lectures we've ever been to, and they say, oh, you want them asking for it. It's the same thing here. When I put that myography scale up and I say, here's normal and here's you, I don't have to say anything. I just sit there and be quiet. And then they say, what can we do? And that's the scenario you want versus um, it being based on symptoms, which is going to affect their compliance, or me trying to talk them into anything. What the 5M does for me specifically is it takes the sales pitch out of it. It doesn't exist in my office, and we do really well. <laughs> but I am the messenger because I've got a good message to give. And then the rest is just very organic. I did seven IPLs today. <laughs> wow. That's uh, that's a lot of IPL. That's a lot of dry eye patients. Thank you so much for that uh, very clarifying answer. Uh, all right. I have just a few more questions. I will try to keep it fairly quick. Uh, how much do dry eye symptoms vary by climate? You know, everybody thinks their climate is the driest, and we've got all the dry eye patients. Me and John Shackett used to lecture a lot with the dry eye protocol, and he's in Denver, Colorado, high altitude. I'm at the beach, and we would go at it all the time. I was like, I don't care. <laughs> dry eye patients, too. So I don't know. Everybody claims that theirs is worse. But, you know, I would say part of the difference might be how you treat it, because in my environment, um, Sometimes we're doing dehumidifiers because it's moldy, because it's so humid. And in his, he's doing humidifiers. Uh, but ultimately, we've all got a high percentage of dry eye patients coming into our office. And more now than this time last year, more now than ever, because you have got, I got to tell you this story, but you've got this mask on and you've got more device use because people are trapped inside and they're on Zoom meetings. So today this lady comes in and she came in for her Procara insertion and she says, I don't understand, my last um, glasses didn't do this and I have her in moisture goggles from IECO and they have this rubber gasket inside and the entire bottom 180 degrees was melted. It was all deformed and I'm like, do you stay hot? <laughs> she's like, no, I stay cold. And I'm sitting there looking at her and she's got this mask on and I'm like, oh. Yeah, there is a lot of hot air in there and it's going up. And that's what's happening to our eyes. And Perryman actually coined this phrase, I think, made M-A-D-E, mask-associated dry eye.
but it's tough because I've got patients I've been seeing a long time and they're supposed to be coming in with no symptoms and now they are and I got to explain to them well you know environment's a little different here's what we need to do about it but whatever my point was yes <laughs> <laughs> all right um I have one sort of cheeky question to ask which is i'm just going to answer it uh my cataract software looks different uh what's going on uh so we regularly release software updates so if you ever have anything that looks slightly different from this presentation uh or if you just want to make sure that you're up to date uh, check in every few months or so give oculus a call uh, our service department will make sure that you are fully up to date and are using the most uh, up-to-date version of both the Keratograph software and the Crystal Tier Report. Highly recommend it. Highly recommend that, please. All we'll, right. Like now you can click on today, last week, last month, and all the patients will be listed there. Just stuff that makes it easier. I love that feature. Mm -hmm. All right. And then final question. Um, it's uh, another product specific question. Are you using Regner eyes at all as an adjunct therapy? Uh, that anti inflammatory drop, I believe. Which one? Uh, Regner eyes. Regenerize. Regenerize. Ah, you, we can I'm tell which one of us is the doctor. <laughs> I'm head going, you know, what he's talking about. Regenerize. Um, to be Perfectly honest, and I always am, I I have not had a lot of experience with it. Um, I have had some, and I, I need a bigger sample size to say this fairly, but I just didn't get this wow factor for the price that was associated and it being out of pocket. Um, if I have somebody who needs this uh, advanced therapy, I'm probably gonna have already done a Procara, and I've got them on autologous blood serum. And now we've got such, and I'm not knocking Regenerize, it's, it's a great product. It's different than your amniotic membrane, it's totally different because it's the fluid, it's not actually the membrane ground up. And that is in the pipeline with biotissue and when that day comes, it's gonna be unbelievable. Uh, and that is much different than just the fluid. But uh, point being, now we have amazing access to autologous blood serum. You do not have to get it locally. You can go through vital tiers V-I-T-A-L, Vital Tears, go to their website, and all I do is put in the prescription in their portal, and they take care of the rest. They call the patient, they figure out where they live and where's the co closest collection point. If it's not close, they can pay two, $20 extra, 20, and they'll come to their house and collect the blood. That's what my mom had done today. Um, once the blood's collected, they just go back home, and a couple days later, it comes in a freezer pack, a frozen box, and that's it. So it's so simple. And basically, they can buy one month, three months, or six months. The more they buy, the cheaper it gets. And whether I write it for once a day or eight times a day, it's the same price to the patient. I'm not telling you what to do, but that's pretty handy, if you know what I mean. Um, they keep them in the freezer. And then they put one in the refrigerator. And once that's used up, they pull out the next one. I never have patients complaining about carrying them around town with them. You know, I say, put it in a Yeti. It's not a big deal. You can also buy on Amazon these little wallets where you put the freezer packs in there for diabetic needles. And then they can just slip it in their purse or pocket. So they never complain about that. Um, I can order it in 20%, 30%, or 40%. I go stronger the more uh, devastated the cornea is but it's a little bit less comfortable because it's not as much saline. And number two, it's more blood. So tell them to drink a lot of water in the days leading up to it, especially if they're getting a six month supply at 40%, you better be hydrated. Perfect. Thank you so much for all of your expertise. Uh, it's always a great time to do a webinar with you, Dr. Brimer. I always learn so much. So thank you for all of your time and expertise and your presentation tonight and answering all of these questions. And uh, thank you everyone for attending and asking all of these wonderful questions. Yeah, thank you so much. And I love speaking for Vision Source, especially um, on the screen right now is my website. And if you go there and click contact us, it will generate an email just to me and no one else. So if you have other questions we couldn't get to or you want resources, the video, something like that, let me know and I'll help. Thanks, have a great night.